it's crazy. It's absolutely crazy. I, I feel like, you know, especially now in this time, um, having something that is tangible that people can watch even when live theater is not happening is really just so, such a gift. Hi, welcome to Place Here Time Now. I'm Pam McKinnon, Artistic Director of American Conservatory Theater, ACT. My guests today are Philippa Sue and Stephen Pasquale. Super excited for this conversation. Philippa Sue is best known for originating the role of Eliza Schuyler Hamilton in Hamilton, garnering her numerous industry awards and a Tony nomination. This fall, Sue will voice a lead role in Netflix animated film Over the Moon, and she was previously a series regular on The Code. Sue co-starred on Broadway in The Parisian Woman, as well as playing the title role in the Broadway musical Amelie, both directed by me. She also originated the role of Natasha in Natasha Pierre and the Great Comet of 1812. She is a graduate of the Juilliard School Drama Division. Stephen Pasquale is a rare leading man on Broadway and off-Broadway who goes back and forth between plays and musicals. He most recently was seen on Broadway opposite Kerry Washington in American Son, which was also made into a film. He also starred in The Bridges of Madison County, for which he received a Drama Desk and Drama League nomination. He was a series regular on Rescue Me and also played Mark Furman on The People vs. O.J. Simpson, and more recently played FBI agent Peter Strzok in The Comey Rule. In. I mean, with the, the magic of editing, this can turn into something artful. So both of you are actors and singers and have and wear other hats as well. You're 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 political animals as well. Um, and I guess I'd, I'd love to start. Let's uh, start talking about acting. And um, when did you know you were an actor? I knew I was an actor. At a pretty young age. I feel like um, the first time that my sort of outside yard imagination time manifested into something that felt like it could be a real thing was when um, I saw a production of The Tempest in Chicago um, in a very small theater. I don't know where it was, but all I remember it was there were only like 15 seats and it was kind of inappropriate. There was some nudity in it. But I remember just thinking like, wow, I'm just so, you know, transported into this world. And I was just like in awe of, of the beauty of it. And I felt like, wow, I feel like this is not far from what I actually just do on my own time when I'm like playing alone in my yard. And not the nudity part, but you know what I mean. Um, <laughs> but like... I just wanted to explore different worlds and, and, you know, play with magic and imagine myself in different places and different times. And I felt like that was the first time I realized, like, maybe that's, that's what I want to do. And this is like age eight, nine, 10? You yeah. don't even know. Yeah. Like, yeah, old enough to be able to read, but young enough to really be quite young, actually. Yeah. I mean, there's, I mean, there is nothing like inappropriate theater, I think, for for that pivotal age. The, 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 the first two shows that I saw that really made an imprint, and they were Broadway, but, and they were with my dad. It was The Wiz, which completely appropriate for a nine-year-old, and um, Elizabeth Suedos' Runaways, completely inappropriate for a nine-year-old. While there were children on stage, they were prostitutes. I mean, it, they were runaways. Um, but my dad leaned in, got the original cast albums of both, and I was hooked. I mean, I, but I, I, I guess I'd, I'd love to hear more about why an actor. Um, well, for me, I was I came late to it. I was uh, a compulsive liar as a kid, and also lived very much in my imagination and was always having imaginary scenes play out. And that sort of ended up manifesting as a love of acting. A little bit later, I was. I was injured in a, in a football game and ended up having the fall with nothing to do. And so I did the play and fell in love with the people and sort of that cliche is my story. Um, and so I, I really found it kind of late. I was 17 uh, uh, when I found it. 
And, I, and, and to answer the, your question about why, it's really interesting, my experience, I came to New York one week and my parents would bring us once a year to see like some shitty Christmas shows and maybe a Broadway show. And one year we saw Blood Brothers um, and Brian Darcy James happened to be understudying David Cassidy and he was on for like the lead role. And I just remember being like just enough of like an adult to be like super moved by the performance. Like the first time I remember vividly being like, my foot's not caught in a bear trap. I'm, my finger's not slammed in the car door and yet there's tears flowing down my face. I don't quite understand what this is, teenage 17 year old boy crying. And I, it was very powerful to me. And so I thought, boy, I'd like to have that impact on somebody else the way this performance has had on me. Yeah, there's something about, well, definitely what I think is true for most people is their first exposure to theater or acting is as an audience member, that you're sitting there and watching a performance being done. And there's something, I think that you either are like, I wanna do that, or you're like, that's really cool, but I would never wanna do that, <laughs> you know? And I think that it's just something that, I think it's something that lives within people I think it's something that like can be learned, but um, certainly like, I think what's the t statistic? Like most people are more afraid of, you know, public speaking than they are of death. Like I I've heard that <laughs> before. Like I, it's true, like it's terrifying. It's extremely vulnerable. But if at the end of the day, it means that whatever I had, whatever connection I made to a performance that I saw, I can give to somebody else to have, in their own way and their own experience like how cool is that especially if i enjoy doing it and i love it that's just the part that we get to you know love what we're doing but like what's really great is we get to share it with other people and in this moment when uh, we aren't doing live theater the way that we have sort of dedicated ourselves to if someone woke you up at like you know from a sound sleep at 3 30 in the morning um, would you sit bolt upright and say, I'm an actor? Like, I'm sort of curious about like identity with this art form and how does that manifest itself as an actor? Well, we're, you know, the sad truth is we're not busy. Um, you know, we're fortunate we have fruitful television film lives. So we, there is a little bit of that starting to, to sort of percolate um, at this point, but that was not the case for a long time. Um, and I think being an actor is a, a hugely self-identifying thing for anyone who, who does it, you know, but uh, in this sort of moment in American history, it does feel like artist as citizen is sort of rearing its head as the most important thing we need to be doing right now to, to just be patient and wait and put it aside and like fight like hell to be good citizens, knowing that we'll return to the thing that we love at some point, but right now, Fighting the good fight as citizens seems to be the full time, the full time gig. It was interesting. I saw today. So we've been following um, John Ossoff, who's running for Senate in Georgia, and um, you know we've been doing a lot of these like virtual events, fundraisers, making videos for theaters and uh, and candidates running, and for organizations and. Um, it's been like a huge part of like our job as actors, as, as artists, as citizens in this world and time. So that's really what's been keeping us the most busy. Um, but to go back to John Ossoff specifically, he says something um, recently in, in one of his debates about empathy. And he, he's basically criticizing Senator Perdue for not having empathy during this time when it's the most a horrible pandemic that has happened in over a century and like this guy has seem seemingly has no empathy from what he has shown us has no empathy for the people who are suffering right now and i feel like it reminded me of really like why i wanted to do this job i wanted to be an actor i wanted to do live performance is because there is a sense of um empathy that you have to experience and practice um, as an actor, but just as an audience member as well, in order to go out into the world and also do that. Like, I think that's what the power of story, that's the way it's like a human need. It's, it's helping us prepare ourselves for 
the hardships and the hard moments that we face in the real world so that we can face it with grace and dignity and empathy and all of the, the things that help humans thrive as a community. Um, so it was nice to feel like, oh yeah, like, you know, even though we're not doing our jobs right now and it seemingly is completely unimportant <laughs> compared to everything else that's happening, I was reminded that it actually is very important, especially because you really can only achieve so much on a screen through your phone. Um, but there's a lot of progress that's made when you're in person experiencing stories um, live and, and you know, when you're in a vulnerable place like that. Yeah, I had a, a colleague and, and friend, um, a director who uh, reconnected with, I think a high school friend of hers who had subsequently become a brain surgeon and, um, and, and they were, were talking and, and this director friend of mine sort of humbly said like, oh my goodness, I, I muck about, I'm, you know, I'm still doing theater. I'm still, you know, I, I bow down to you for the work that you're doing. And the, the doctor, the scientist said, I actually do the work I do because of the work you do because because like like the I'm studying the brain and I'm you know I want to find a cure for Alzheimer's and other dementia so that people can actually engage in story like if we don't have the arts then what then what what are we on the planet for um, which I you know I sort of grab onto sometimes Stephen I think you were about to say something I was going to agree with you like what are we without this bit of culture like what I mean the arts is how we how any culture defines itself in terms of its legacy right so it's just so the importance of this job has reared its head in this time a lot I think you know history is told by our leaders and our warriors and our storytellers and so it is like an essential worker without question you know can we talk a little bit about process because I don't even understand acting process. You are my, some of my primary collaborators. I live with an actor as well. I know when John is um, doing a play in particular, um, you know, even during, you know, a run of a play around 4 p.m., I can sort of feel his energy shift. Well, I think that, you know, an actor's process is the most like mysterious part of, the storytelling thing, you know, and I, I teach a class every spring where we, we, we really talk about what it's actually like to be an actor and what it's really like to be in front of a camera or on a stage and that your process and getting there is your own and everyone's is different. Um, and so the first thing I'd say is like, I don't know that I've ever met two actors whose process is identically the same. I think there are some similarities like John, if we're doing a, performance at night, something clicks in at like four or 5 p.m. where you start to just kind of begin to think about it as a horse, you know, at the, at the starting gate, sort of scraping your hooves against the, the ground a bit. And then there's, a, there's absolutely a biological that things, thing that happens at the end of a performance where you're just like euphoric, really high energy, right? Doesn't that seem like super common? Yeah, I, I feel like I, um... <laughs> I equate, I, I visualize my process to be kind of like um, an exploration in an uncharted territory, like, like going on a hike that I've never gone on before or um, going on a hike where there are no paths, right? Like say you're working on something new. That's like, you're going on a hike, there's no blazed trail. You have a, a map, you have your script, um, and you have yourself and you have any equipment that you might need in order to like make your process into getting where you need to go as easy uh, and meaningful as possible, right? Um, but then you might be working on a play that's already been done before. So like that's a trail that's been blazed before. Like there's, you know, other people who've done it, but you have your own way of approaching it. Um, and if you've, if you've taken a trail or you've created a trail for yourself in the rehearsal process through this story, like navigating through this story, you know the trail. So like what you did to get on that trail in the first place, you don't have to do it all over again the next time you do it. 
you already have done it once. So, you know, it gets to a point in a performance where sometimes I feel like I don't have to prepare at all. And I just have to show up and do the show and it's all there, knowing that I've done the work, I've prepared myself, I've been, you know, blazing this trail for months. So I know my way around very well. I don't need my map anymore. Um, and and I think really like the, the only difference is that instead of an uncharted territory of like, you know, some mountain range or desert or wherever you're you're going through, you're going through a story and you have to imagine and convince, take the ride with the audience that that story has never happened before, right? So there's like a level of like tri trickery there that it feels like the first time, even though as an actor, you know you've done it many, many times before. So. You know, it's funny, I'll, I'll, uh, this is a secret that I started to share lately that I, I realize other actors feel similarly. You know, when we make a play together, we have four weeks in the room together, then we have our 10 days of tech, and then we have our three to four weeks of uh, previews, and then all the critics come and make their judgments. And for me, I always feel like a month after that is when I've unlocked sort of on a surgical level, really what I think the performance should be. So for me, the, all of that sort of process, I never really get to what feels to me like close to the finish line until everyone's come they've already made their opinions it's a success or not but that moment for me tends to happen a month or two after the preview period um, not that week that the critics come that's always still kind of like figuring it out um so that i thought i think that's a that's an interesting um thing for young actors to 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 know you know that that's not uh i think it's uncommon for people to feel like it's it's like surgically ready at that point in the process. Yeah, I, I, I mean, that, that, that definitely resonates for me. I mean, I, I, uh, the first time that I directed Who's Afraid of Virginia Woolf at Steppenwolf, we got to a certain place on opening night with a lot of huge emotional, intellectual, psychological questions still being posed, you know, the afternoon of opening. And then I got on a plane as a director, I get on a plane, you know, the next morning, and I happened to be getting on a plane to fly to San Diego to dive into a rehearsal hall with um, Miller's Death of a Salesman. So I had this crazy back-to-back -back of a wolf followed by Death of a Salesman. And then seven weeks later, went back to Chicago for literally closed the closing matinee at Steppenwolf and they had put it together. You were into a runner, so you punched yourself because you wanted to make that discovery months earlier, but you need, you need the time. I think. No, you need the time. So when you're working on Who's Afraid of Virginia Woolf and you're prepping to do Death of a Salesman, are you thinking these are the two most perfect American pieces of theater that have ever been written ever? Are you, are, you, are you taking on the size of that or are you thinking one's better than the other as a piece of writing? What are you thinking in that moment? Yeah, I mean, I, mean I, I try to step into a process thinking that, you know, in, in, in the same way that I'd step in with a, uh, with a new play and excited to work with the collaborators and the cast and the designers um, and the space. Um, so, you know, trying to break it down. I certainly remember having conversations with, you know, the cast of Who's Afraid of Virginia Woolf, Tracy Letts in tech, going to the closet for the first time and, you know, picking out like the schlumpy, mm -hmm. the schlumpy sweater and going, oh dear God, I knew I'd be wearing this sooner or later, but here it is. And feeling like the mantle of history, whether it's Richard Burton, you know, whether it's, you know, just like a 50 year old play, oh, it's the sweater and I'm now wearing it. Um, and so you try not to need to put that sweater on too early and you make it your own until those like those artifacts, you know, get, get, get put into your process. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, that was, a, that was a, you know, an, a, an amazing back to back. And as you said, Philippa, that there is something about at a certain point, if you've built it, and those plays were definitely built before I stepped into them, there, there's, a, there's a track to follow. And it, there's, there's big scaffolding. And you can, it's not that they're easy, it's not that the scaffolding is easy to climb, but it is available to you. Those, those plays are done 50, 60 years later for a reason.
Yeah. And, and because, well, I think mean, there's that, that feeling of needing to climb because there's a new audience, you know, there's a new time, a new culture, a new perspective to unveil this story to, even if they've heard it before, they're never hearing it in the same way. And Selden in particular right now, my God, the sort of just the great lie that everyone's telling themselves in America right now. And oh man, those, those, but I suppose you could say the same things about Sondheim's great musicals and you know, all the great works. They're so timeless. And um, just getting to put sort of our spin on them is like one of the perks of getting to do this job, you know? Absolutely. Are there, are there projects as actors that, that you, like extant classics that you'd love to step into? I've always wanted to do Streetcar, but I've, I think I've turned 43 this year. So I think I missed the boat. Um, but I really have wanted to work on that in some capacity. Um, I'm going to do Streetcar. Yeah, you're still young enough. <laughs> 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 I'm one of those, I'm one of those actresses that just really loves Hedda Gabler. I love Hedda. I'm interested in her. She scares me. Pippa really wants to play that. against her perfect face. <laughs> she wants to play like the most fucked up. <laughs> like a production of like Medea. <laughs> you know? Yeah, something like that. <laughs> in terms of process, like I just, you know, maybe like four or five years ago, I started to think, oh gosh, I'm now entering the middle of my life and there are a bunch of things, a bunch of parts I didn't get to play. And it made me, question some of the years I've spent on television I should have done I should have been here doing you know South Pacific and the light in the piazza and all these things that I felt like oh, I'll just get I'll get back to that at some at some point you know I mean no regrets but with that moment of entering a new phase in your life where you think oh okay so now um you know Romeo I'm never going to do that play so when you get the opportunity as a at any point in your career to do so, to, to play a, a great part in a great play you just got to like jump all over it you know I remember thinking we did Carousel at the Lyric Opera in Chicago, like, I don't know, five years ago. And there was such an assumption that that would be the production that moved beyond that to be the next revival of Carousel um, that I didn't appreciate every day working on it. And I'm so re regretful of that. It was amazing. And I got to say, I did it and played that part or whatever. But because I thought we would move it to New York and we'd spend a year and a half doing these roles and like, uh, I didn't, I didn't like look in the mirror every day and be like, just, this is so fun. Just go to the, just play this part and like know that it could be over in, in a month and you're not going to get to play this part again. Um, but life lessons. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Both of you have had such Broadway centric stage careers and, and I guess we, we have to talk about Hamilton at least for, you know, a couple minutes. I mean, so, so Philippa, I mean, that was, you went to Juilliard. Um, you auditioned for Comet, right? And did that straight out of grad school? Yeah, so I graduated and I went to the audition like a couple weeks later. We didn't start, you know, rehearsals until the fall, but yeah. And then shortly after that, you were in workshops for Hamilton, is that right? Or, was, or, 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 or were you there for, for, the, for the, the original production of it? Um, Yes, so Workshops of Hamilton, which subsequently happened around the same time as Workshops for Amelie. Um, workshops for Hamilton at the tail end of Comet. A lot of, a lot of workshops. You know, that was something that I really like, hadn't anticipated and found so much joy and was like getting to be a part of all these cool rooms where people were trying out all their new stuff. Um, Hamilton being one of them, Amelie being one of them. And so, yes, Hamilton uh, had a workshop and then, uh, or had some uh, readings and then a workshop and then the, uh, the public run downtown. In other words, she had no idea what it's like to not be in something entirely successful for like <laughs> three and a half years. The first three and a half years were like the two biggest hits in town. Yeah, amazing, right? I mean, yeah, both both of those leave leave just such a huge mark. And I know, I know, Philippa, that you and I have had conversations. If you said, like, what is the lasting effect on you of Hamilton? And you've said, I, I will be unpacking that forever. Yeah, yeah it's it's crazy. It's absolutely crazy. <laughs> I I feel like, um, you know, especially now in this time, having something that is tangible that people can watch, even when live theater is not happening, is really 
such a gift. But I, but I do hope that like it inspires people to want to come see live theater that like, this is not, you know, this is not it. This is a version of it, but this is not it. Um, and, and it's also interesting because I'm going a little bit off now, but you know, I think Hamilton, you know, we were in such a different place when we were doing it on stage. And then when it came out this year, you know, it was in the midst of a worldwide movement for racial justice. I think people were a little bit like, we were all a little bit like, wait, but Hamilton happened. Like, <laughs> like this is confusing to me because now like I'm questioning a lot of the, you know, you know, the things that we're seeing in Hamilton, are we addressing slavery enough? Like what's interesting and unique to me is that like, these were all questions that we could have asked, you know, three years ago when we were doing it on Broadway. But it really wasn't until now that all of these questions were coming to the forefront and and really like gnawing at people's hearts and souls. Um, I just I get you know back to audience. It just goes to show you that an audience, no matter who they are, their perspective is going to change and shift depending on the times, depending on what's happening. Yeah, absolutely. And theater, uh, you know, is also is is wrestling with big questions. I hope the entire country is wrestling with big questions about racial justice and how to move forward. It does feel like this is a, a confluence of the, of the pandemic and people really asking, demanding more than asking that change be made and not just talked about. Yeah, I think like, you know, making spaces for not only diverse stories and diverse group of actors, but everything from on stage, off stage, everywhere, every single part of it, we sort of have to like reconstruct in our minds as to like why things are the way they are and what can we do to change that? Um, because it takes, it takes a lot of um, work on, on oneself and on, on an organization to come to terms with like old ways maybe of functioning that weren't intentional, but certainly weren't actively aware of the, the changes that could be made. Because this podcast is called Place Here, Time Now, it's sort of, you know, it's, a, it's an homage to the beginning of a play. I'm going to uh, pick up a play next to me and read the beginning of A Place Here, Time Now. And then I'm going to ask the two of you, either together or singly, because you actually are together right now, they happen to be married, um, but uh, to describe your setting, your place, physical, and the time where you are, and I will do the same. But I'm gonna pick up a play and see how this person did it. So this is Edward Albee's Seascape, which was um, the, the first play that I did at ACT now, a year and a half ago, I guess. But Edward wrote this play in 1975 and he starts his play. The curtain rises, Nancy and Charlie on a sand dune, bright sun. They are dressed informally. There is a blanket and a picnic basket. Lunch is done. Nancy is finishing putting things away. There is a pause and then a jet plane is heard from stage right to stage left, growing becoming deafeningly loud, diminishing. So that's Edward Albee's Seascape Place Here Time Now. Um, I'm going to jump into my Place Here Time Now. Um, sitting in a dining room in a pre-war San Francisco apartment, uh, there are windows to the left. There is an archway to the right leading to a little hallway and rooms beyond. There is a door behind the lone figure in a very cluttered what has become an office and command central for a very large theater. <laughs> Lights up. <laughs> That's great. Well, our place would be two scraggly dressed pajama wearing out of work actors sitting at their dining table. It's a, a foggy day. A foggy fall, Brooklyn day. Floor to ceiling windows adorn the south and eastern walls. And the time is now on the precipice of fascism. 
sprinting towards us in America 2020. I'd like to call the time the turning point. The great, the great wake up call? The great wake up call. Yeah, yours is a little more sunny than mine. Lights up. <laughs> Lights up. <laughs> Anything else the two of you want to add? Thinking about uh, all of our great inst theater institutions every day out there, hoping you guys are putting one foot in front of the other and yeah. going to make it back to uh, to having lights up in your in your spaces once there's a vaccine and a new administration is going to take it fucking seriously and that we all on the other side of this can can be making great work together. Yeah, we're ready. We're like we're just waiting for the green light. We just wanted to. Yeah. I mean, this whole thing has been an exercise in what good, the difference between good government and bad government. We'd be back. We'd be having pool parties if we had just done what every other fucking developed nation has done. Thailand, South Korea, New Zealand, anyone where there's a woman in charge. Oh. <laughs> mm -hmm. And maybe the, maybe the upside is people are awake now and we were a little bit asleep for a long time and now we're really very much awake. I, I, that's the lesson I hope is happening. Mm -hmm. Thank you both. This was a pleasure. Great Thanks. to see you. See you, you too. too. Give John our best. Yeah, absolutely. Go to the theater. I don't see plays. <laughs> a lot of really smart people are saying plays are stupid. Theater is for gay people and no other people. Uh, get this out of my house. Lights up. Please, lights down, please, lights down. <laughs>